So now that I've gone through this example and now that you've seen how out of order execution is used to do multiple things in parallel and reduce stall cycles, let's go back to this design here and walk through the many details and make sure that we understand all of them. Okay, so again, let's start at the start where you do branch prediction, you figure out where you're going, hopefully you're correct most of the time, you bring in a bunch of instructions and now those instructions are going to get decoded and renamed. So now let me explain what renaming does. The first instruction is going to get placed in reorder buffer entry number one. That has a temporary storage that corresponds to it, which is called T1. So I look at this instruction and say, you're going to do R1 plus R2. So that's exactly what you do here. And then when you produce a result, instead of putting it in R1, I'm going to first put it in T1. And so that's why the destination gets renamed to T1. Then you look at the second instruction. It says, I'm using R1 and R3. So R3 is just as usual. But this R1 refers to the value that was produced by the previous instruction. And that value R1 or that name R1 just got renamed to T1. So instead of getting my input from R1, I'm going to get it from T1. So that's what renaming does. It realizes that in addition to these 32 register names here, in this example where I have six reorder buffer entries, I have six additional names. I have six additional places that a value could be stored in. And so sometimes I may be referring to those values. So I'm renaming these instructions so that every instruction writes its result into its corresponding temporary storage unit. And I'm renaming some of the input operands so that they point correctly to these temporary storage units and not to this register file over here. Okay, I can add a lot more detail, but I'll just stop here for now. I hope you've got some sense for what the rename unit is trying to do. And this also shows you how when you finish, you put your result into a temporary storage unit here. And later when it's time to commit, when the first instruction completes, it's going to go through a commit process where the value that was temporarily written into T1 gets copied into register R1 in this example. And then whatever value was in T2, then when that instruction is produced, it puts its value into its home, which in this example is R2, because that's what the instruction intended. And then later when instruction four finishes, and when it's instruction four's turn to commit, it's going to copy its value into the intended register, which is R3, right? So the commit basically happens sequentially. When the oldest instruction completes, it's ready to make its state permanent and it gets copied into the register file. Now, the reason that we are doing this in order commit, right? Like, like I said earlier, if you let things write their results into the register file out of program order, that leads to chaos. That makes it harder for a programmer to debug and step through the code. It can also lead to problems in terms of branch mispredicts, right? So in this example, I have a branch sitting over here. There was a branch prediction unit over here that made a guess that the branch is going to go a certain way. And you started fetching instructions from that certain way. Later in time, you know, once you've resolved dependencies, once you've finished previous instructions, and once you've figured out the value of R2, you may finally realize that, oh, you know, I actually mispredicted that branch. I actually went the wrong way. When you figure that out, all the instructions after that get squashed from the instruction fetch queue, from the issue queue, from the reorder buffer. And that's the reason why I don't want to be too eager in making my results permanent, right? So when an instruction over here, let's say when this instruction finishes, it's going to put its result into temporary storage T5. And the reason I don't make it permanent and you know stick it straight into register R1 is because the branch may end up being mispredicted later. And at that point, I want to squash everything else after that. But if I've already made the result permanent in the register file, I've lost whatever old value was sitting there. So all of these instructions that are brought in are somewhat speculative because I'm not yet sure that I want to execute these instructions, right? Because there are previous branches that have not yet been resolved. And so that's why all these instructions put their values into temporary registers in the reorder buffer. And later you have an in-order commit process that makes these values permanent. Now let me spend a couple more minutes on the issue queue, but you've already kind of seen what this does, right? So once I have renamed instructions, I put them in over here. And then every instruction here has a couple of bits that tell me if my input operands are ready or not. Okay, so this could be perhaps the state of the issue queue where all of these input operands are not available, but you're bound to have at least one instruction where the two input values are available, right? Because the oldest instruction you know, should have both of its input operands available most of the time. So that oldest instruction says, since both my input operands are available, I'll go ahead and issue. 
I will go execute on the ALUs. Once I finish, I will write my result into T1. And what I'll also do is I'll broadcast to the issue queue saying that T1 is now available. So every instruction that depends on T1 sets that bit saying, okay, T1 is now available. And again, I scan through my issue queue and I look for instructions that have both their operands available. And if both of the operands are available, then I leave the issue queue, I go into the ALU unit, I read my values from the register file or from the temporary storage. I produce a result and then I store that result back into the reorder buffer, right? So that's kind of how the issue queue is able to figure out if there are two instructions that are ready to execute. So if you look at this example here, let me first clear this out. So we said that this load instruction, you know, it's going to be sitting in the issue queue, it's waiting for R4. Similarly, this instruction is also sitting in the issue queue waiting for R4. When this instruction completes, it's going to broadcast to the issue queue saying R4 is now available. And so both of these instructions say, well, this is the operand I was waiting for, it's available. And so both leave the issue queue in the same cycle. And so both complete at the same time in cycle seven. All right, so that's how the issue queue is able to do that. So to some extent, I've kind of explained what each of these units does and how it's able to achieve high parallelism and you're able to execute instructions out of order and not be limited by the fact that there were some data dependencies for earlier instructions. So it's worth noting that most modern processors today are out of order, right? So you have some very simple processors in certain mobile devices or in specific niche segments of the market, but a large fraction of the processor market relies on high performance and it relies on the high performance that out of order execution can deliver, right? So most modern processors, especially the ones in desktops, laptops, even the processors on cell phones, do use this kind of out of order execution. And out of order execution is also expensive in terms of power consumption because you're trying to do multiple instructions at the same time, right? So you're trying to finish your work in less time, which always means higher power. You are also going to use a deep pipeline because there are circuits like decode and rename, which have more work to do. You have an issue queue that's basically scanning the queue, you know, broadcasting values when they complete. And all of that also takes a lot of power, also requires more pipeline stages, more latches. There's also a speculative element over here because you're bringing in the next, say, 50 instructions and executing them early, even before you've resolved earlier branches, right? So when a branch mispredict happens, you end up squashing tens of instructions, and that's an example of wasted work, right? So you, there were all these instructions that you brought into the pipeline that you even finished executing completely, and then you realize that, that you were on the wrong path, and then you throw away all of that work. So all of that costs energy and power, and so as a result, out-of-order processes also consume a fair bit of power while giving you high performance.